a quarter of all of the meat produced in the United States, that's chicken, that's beef, you know, that's pork, is being fed to dogs and cats. And that's when I really woke up, right? Because a quarter of all the meat produced, about 30% of all the greenhouse gas emissions associated with meat production are due directly to pet food. That's whenever as a vet, I said, okay, I'm a part of the problem. I'm not the hero of the story after all. I've got to do something to solve this. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, 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 and welcome to episode number 100 of the Call the Vet Show. I'm your host, veterinarian Dr. Alex, and I've got an absolute corker for you today. When I first started thinking about bringing you interviews with true experts in their field, Dr. Ernie Ward was actually the very first person on the list that I produced. And that's because he's someone that I do admire greatly with his passion for the work that he gets involved with, with his foresight for the topics that he covers. And he is a really important voice in the veterinary community, I believe, with talking about the future of veterinary medicine, the future of the care that we provide for our patients as an industry but also the impact that all of us are having on the planet, which is absolutely what we're talking about today. But before we jump into that conversation, I also wanted to say thank you. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for getting me to 100 episodes. It really is a bit of a milestone. And I hope that I have been able to provide you and your furry family with value. I hope you've taken some of that information, you've utilised it in your day-to-day life, when it comes to planning the best care for your pet. And I hope that they really are healthier as a result. Thank you too for all of those of you who have left a review over on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to the show. You know, that really helps more than you can imagine with other people finding the show. And the main way that podcasts like this one grow is through word of mouth. So for every share that you've done on social media, for every friend or family member who you've told about the podcast show or you've shared a particular episode with them, um, you know, thank you again for that because it really has helped me reach more people and helped impact lives of pets across the world. And so let's get stuck into today's episode, which is all about the sustainability of the pet food industry, the impact that the pet food industry is having on climate change, the impact that it is having on ecosystems across the planet, and how we can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Because really, the time is now. We absolutely have to make this change as a global population, and we can all be part of of this solution. Here's this episode's expert interview. Dr. Eddie Ward, it's my absolute pleasure to be talking to you today. Thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, Alex, it's my pleasure. And I'm a huge fan of all the work that you've been doing for the past few years. I got to tell you, you do a great service for pet parents all over the world. And you've certainly reached all the way to North America and, and where I live in North Carolina. Oh, well, thank you very much for those kind words. And you've been, um, yeah, like a bit of an inspiration to me with what I've been doing. But um, before we jump into kind of the meat of what we're going to talk about, I'd love for you to give our listeners a bit of a background into all of the work you do, because we'll probably (laughs) take up a whole podcast episode in itself. But a brief background about, you know, your life as a veterinarian and then what made you aware and really interested and dive deep into the environmental impact of the pet food industry? Yeah, great question, Alex. Uh, you know, I've been a veterinarian now for almost 30 years, so a little bit ahead of you for sure. Uh, and just like many people in America, you know, I treated primarily dogs and cats, small companion animals. Uh, you know, I dibble dabbled with exotics and with large animals, you know, from time to time. But, you know, the bulk of my work was always done in the clinic. You know, I opened several clinics over the course of my career. I got into some pet retail settings. So did a lot of interesting things, uh, you know, that you would probably relate to. And so, 
uh, over the course of my career, I was always very focused on preventing illness and extending longevity and quality of life. And so that's what really backed me into the study of nutrition. So about 10 years or so into my clinical practice, you know, I really started focusing on longevity and quality of life. And as I mentioned, that led me to obesity and nutrition, because obviously of all the things that you do to extend the quality of life and, and lifespan of your pet, uh, it's what you feed it. And so that's where I became really interested. I started a, an organization called the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention back in 2005. And we now are you know, one of the, the global leaders around pet obesity and, and topics associated with it. At the same time, a lifelong vegan, or let's my adult lifetime. I'm an adult vegan, uh, and so you know I was beginning to explore using alternative protein diets, plant-based diets for dogs, and and not so much for cats. But that's a slightly different story that we'll touch on in a little bit. As I started going down the health route of plant-based diets, so what are the the health advantages potentially of feeding different protein sources to dogs and cats? I started really coming to grips with the environmental impact, which is what we'll talk about some today. And so that's kind of leads us up to where we are today. I have uh, no longer active in clinical practice. I sold the last of my clinics a few years ago. I now have a couple of businesses that I, I am a co-owner of. One of them is called Affordable Pet Labs, which actually we have veterinary technicians or nurses that go to people's homes and procure different lab samples, blood and urine and different lab samples. And then, of course, we allow them you know, to get the results to their vet or whomever they, they choose to do it. I also am a co-owner of a company called Vert Vertical vet. We have about 1,200 vet clinics in the United States that are members, and we offer a wide variety, whether it's ordering their supplies or giving them educational materials and training, which is what I'm in charge of and the company. So it's been a, an interesting career. Many people, if you follow me on Instagram, You'll see, I also do a lot of endurance athletics. I'm a longtime Ironman athlete. You know, I'm a, a triathlon coach and a personal trainer. So I have this other life, but I, I love endurance events and I love surfing. I mean, that is really my family's passion, you know, and uh, I love paddle boarding, long distance paddle boarding. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you know, the M2O or the Molokai to Oahu race this year will be virtual once again. So I'll be participating again. So if you're into that kind of endurance event, but definitely. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Two kids, they're all grown. You know, beautiful wife I've been with since 1986. You know, kind of the the same story. <laughs> oh, that's not the same story as most people, Ernie. I'll tell you that. I don't know how you time, have time to fit that all in. It's amazing. And I guess anyone who says that you know a vet is you know all they do is or all they're destined to do is be in a con consult room, then that's proof that there's so much that vets get involved with across all kinds of different industries. So with that in mind, with your kind of the vegan interest, you know, and that's our impact on you know on the planet and on the world i think a lot of people will be surprised and i certainly was when i you know picked up your book surprised about the size of the impact the the pet food industry and and particularly the i guess the meat footprint our dogs and cats have so what kind of size are we talking about so people can have a, a picture of that yeah, that's a, another excellent starting point. So basically, like many people who lived a vegan lifestyle or plant-based vegetarian, you know, just eat less meat. I kind of assumed that my pets weren't a part of the problem. In fact, for all these years, I assumed I was the hero of the story, right? I'm not the guy who's contributing to climate change. You know, I'm not the guy who's causing animal suffering, you know, because I don't eat them. And I was really oblivious to sort of the environmental impacts in particular and, and suffering that pet food contributed. And then a colleague, Dr. Gregory Oaken from uh, University of California in LA, UCLA, published a study in 2017 that really shook me and made me become much more active in, in proclaiming this message. And, and that actually was the catalyst for the book. And, and of course, you know, fantastic researcher. But he published a study where he looked at, okay, how much meat in the United States is actually being fed to dogs and cats. Okay. So it's a pretty simple premise, a difficult calculation to ascertain, but you know, that's what he wanted to set out. So how much of all the meat that's being produced? And it's complicated because remember a lot of the meats that are being fed to dogs and cats are not human grade. They're not fit for human consumption. So they're considered to be waste. So, you know, does that factor into it? And he said, well, we'll, we'll kind of discount the waste materials. We'll just look at actually the meat. And at the end of his brilliant, elegant paper, he concluded that about 25, to 30%. And there's a slight variation because depending on how we define meat 
and actually consumption, but about a quarter of all of the meat produced in the United States, that's chicken, that's beef, you know, that's pork is being fed to dogs and cats. And that's when I really woke up, right? Because a quarter of all the meat produced, about 30% of all the greenhouse gas emissions associated with meat production are due directly to pet food. That's whenever as a vet, I said, okay, I'm a part of the problem. I'm not the hero of the story after all. I've got to do something to solve this. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's a really good differentiation to make, I guess, the, the premium cuts of meat and the byproducts. But the byproduct, just using the byproduct still wouldn't necessarily excuse that because I think one th- another thing, and there was lots of things that I was completely unaware of, is I guess how much those byproducts are, are propping up the meat industry. They're actually not just, oh, well, if they weren't being fed to pets, then it wouldn't really matter. They'd just be going in the garbage because that's not true, is it? No, it's not. And in fact, it's a huge profit center for a meat industry. In general uh, terms, uh, it's about 20% of their profit. You know, So selling waste materials to pet food companies is a serious amount of money. And that's why, again, you know, they're very, I would say, a focused lobby. <laughs> so in the United States and really around the world, they intensely scrutinize any legislation, any rules or regulations that might somehow impact it. I mean, uh, almond milk and oat milk are being now challenged to use the word milk, you know, and so, and we've seen this, of course, all across the globe. And so, you know, it's those kind of little things that that you say, wow, okay, this is sensitive, right? And that's why we're beginning to see now, at least in the United States and in parts of Europe, particularly the UK, they're a backlash by the meat lobby against pet foods that are using analogs as well. Okay. And is the problem, so I guess there's, because I th- we'll come on to the alternative diets and things a little bit later, but I wonder, is the problem actually getting worse as people are looking for those premium cuts? So they're rejecting the byproducts. So even though, you know, it's not ideal that we're using the byproducts or, or whatever, that we're using more, you know, prime cuts, if you like, and also people looking more towards kind of raw diets and, and bath and all that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, Alex, I love it because this tells me that you actually critically read the book because that's one of the key points I try to make with my co-author, uh, Alex Ov- Alice Oven from the UK. This was the most concerning thing to me. And look, the BARF diet originated in Australia. So you guys are all too familiar with it. And I don't want to get into a debate over the pros and the cons and the particular issues around the, the health attributes or therefore of potentially of, of a BARF type of diet. But I do want to say as we've switched to more premium cuts, more human grade cuts, then that just means there's less, you know, for humans. And this is actually driving the cost of meat up globally. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because during the research of the book, you know, we interviewed people from all types of, of industries, including many from traditional meat. So whether it's pork, beef, and chicken, you know, we interviewed everybody for this. And, and you could tell that they even had concerns about human grade meats being diverted to pet foods because they felt like that didn't allow them to get meat to humans around the globe. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a very multifaceted problem, but you're absolutely right. As we move towards raw diets, barf diets, high grade, human grade, then that just means that those cuts aren't going to be used for human feeding. What about fish and other things? Because I guess we've got our cats, you know, they love fish. Hey, I'm not part of the problem, but fish is uh, on a knife edge, isn't it? Fish stocks and everything like that as well. Yeah, it really is. And if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix, Sea Spiracy, I encourage you to. I mean, obviously, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia uh, has just been devastated you know, because the impacts of overfeeding in Southeast Asia directly impact the Great Barrier Reef. So, I mean, we are all interconnected, especially when, from an oceanic sea life perspective. But, you know, Alex, it's interesting about one of the things that I brought out in the book was like even things like human trafficking. There have been many, many international investigations that have concluded that that you know, many of the fisheries, particularly off Southeast Asia, you know, these are people that are indentured servants, for lack of a better term. In fact, that's some of the legal terms that they use. So it's a really dirty organization, you know. So I think that a lot of the commercial fishing, we tend to view it in romantic terms, right? Like we think yeah. of the dairy farm as being, you know, the family farm, you know, with the five cows and the, the daughters out there milking it every 6 a.m. Uh, and of course, it's nothing like that whatsoever. It's a highly mechanized, you know, there's about a hundred cows in a circle and they're rotated around a machine. I mean, it's really robotic and, and looks like something from another planet. And same thing with fishing. You know, these are, are big long line trawlers that are hauling in, you know, thousands and thousands of fish. And sadly, in many cases, the vast majority of that is bycatch. Those are just fish that are 
killed because that's not what they're targeting, right? So everything else just dies. Fish is a tough one for me. And here I live at the beautiful coast uh, of North Carolina. And it does break my heart because, you know, right now, I mean, scientists estimate that 90% of the species, you know, of sea life are gone. You know, that's, that's it. And, you know, we're rapidly, you know, just extinguishing this entirely, you know, necessary ecosystem on our planet. And it breaks my heart. And I'll tell you too, Alex, you know, one of the things that you guys are really in tune with in Australia, just the impact of algal for uh, species. So, you know, algae in the ocean produce the majority of the oxygen that we breathe and need to live. And of course, as we deplete different fish species, that upsets the entire life cycle or ecosystem within the ocean, which means these algae then aren't kept in check, which allows them to overgrow, not producing more oxygen, but actually competing with each other. And so now we have, you know, all types of really what we would consider environmental or, or biological contaminants. This is not helping us at at all to remove predator prey relationships. So it's a very interconnected, complex system. But you know, when you damage one aspect over here, I mean, downstream or down under, <laughs> you know, yeah. the consequences are severe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the interconnected nature of everything is just. I mean, I think it's only even now. I mean, I read the algae thing not that long ago, actually, and you know, it's only now becoming really better understood but even then i think it's only kind of you know the tip of the iceberg that people realize and alex one of the things too with climate change i mean so like for every quarter temperature degree centigrade that we raise i mean this actually now causes different algal species to bloom and again not all of them are going to be helpful for us so it's it's um you know, you guys had the horrible, you know, bushfires a couple of years ago. In fact, uh, I was able to interview one of the wildlife officers from Australia for a media uh, story back then. And, you know, it was really interesting because I think that for a brief moment in time, it was like when the Amazon forests were on fire, like the world got focused on climate change, right? I mean, and sadly, then they move on to the next shiny story. But the reality is, you know, I think Australians definitely have a much more intimate relationship with climate change than many other places in the world, because you are an island and your island was on fire. And that's frightening. That must have been terrifying, no matter where you were in Australia. And to know that, wow, greenhouse gas emissions produced in China are a part of my problem here in Australia, that's eye opening. And it just it's a call to action. And again, I applaud your government. Uh, you and New Zealand really have done a fantastic job of, of supporting a lot of, of these climate change initiatives and really being vocal about it as well. I mean, I'm very, very pleased uh, with what you guys have done. Obviously, the US politics has been a little in disarray for the past few years. But, you know, I think we're back in the Paris Accord and, and that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's not go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if ever there was a call to action, we've just heard it, that really the time is now and we need to be looking at every aspect of our life. Also, I mean, we hear these, a lot of the problem or a lot of the concern I have maybe is that we hear all of these, you know, stories of doom and gloom and the world's going to end and, you know, we're all going to be baked as the, the temperature rises. And we sit here thinking, well, I'm just one person. Right. The choices that I make or the small changes that I make aren't important. But equally, there's that good meme of, you know, oh, this bit of plastic's not important with a thousand million people throwing it over their shoulder into the trash. So people can absolutely make a difference. And, and pet food is one of those areas. And there's options available right now, aren't there? And it's no secret, you know, I helped uh, found, uh, I'm no longer with, uh, we kind of lost, uh, we didn't agree on the importance of science and research, which is a big problem in big business, you know, but I did uh, co-found a plant-based dog food company. We were wildly successful and that's part of the problem, you know, when money enters a lot of these things and I had to leave, but regardless, the solutions for dogs are pretty clear. I mean, dogs can thrive. They are omnivores, you know, they are obligate uh, scavengers <laughs> is the term I like to use. We know that, that these guys are opportunistic in what they eat. And so for dogs, I think the, the science, the evidence is clear and mounting that they can do very well on meat analog. So whether this is plant-based proteins, or as we're going to see, you know, in the book, we talk a lot about cell-based proteins and cultured meats and fermented meats. I mean, the future is really almost here when it comes to meat analogs. And you're seeing Beyond Burger, like you probably have Beyond Burger, yeah. Beyond Meat, like that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing very quickly come online. For cats, there are a couple of companies that are doing some fantastic work with cell-based chickens. And so that's going to be online 
most likely within the next two to three years. And so, you know, I kind of have parked that aspect of, of what I'm talking about with cats until we have better alternatives, because really to do a plant-based diet with the current protein mix that we have, you wind up relying heavily on synthetic vitamins and, and additives. And I not, that's not, I'm not always comfortable with that. So I think it can be done. And if you're really interested, I mean, there are plenty of resources that can help you. And there's a couple of commercial diets available you know, worldwide. But again, there's only a couple for that very reason. But regardless, the meats that we see today, you know, I think that the other issue is that people think of these meats that they're feeding their dog as being the ultimate in protein. And when you look at the risk of contaminants, you know, when you look at the risk of adulterants, you know, so we're talking about like plastics and metals and all these other things that are really in the processing. I kind of go, wait a second. They're actually, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, some of these plant-based proteins are probably superior and people make a lot of to do about like uh, bioavailability and digestibility. And th that is a true concern. But the reality is we've done plenty of science, especially around like pea protein, for example, dogs have a tremendous ability to, to digest that no problem whatsoever. So the bioavailability of many of these plant-based proteins are equal to that of beef, you know, or chicken. Um, and so I think that, that we've really entered into an era where people need to be a little more open-minded. As you mentioned, it's a bit like throwing the one piece of plastic over your shoulder and saying, I can't make a difference. Well, even if you chose to feed your dog less meat, you know, that is an impactful decision because if tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pet parents around the world chose to do that, it would make a tremendous impact overnight. Yeah, absolutely. From, I guess, one thing that I think, you know, well, we've already kind of cut, touched on the fact that, well, hey, Dr. Ward, these aren't species specific diets. My dog was, you know, designed to, to eat meat and nothing but meat. The other thing that people, I think, worry about very much, and you touch on that as well, is safety. You know, I guess, what would you say to that with view of the fact that we've had kind of the scare with kind of pea, lentil, heart failure, kind of link and all, and, you know, there's been numerous different scares because these are still fairly new diets in the scheme of things, aren't they? Right. And, and and to be frank, that's why I left the company because we have to do more research. And if companies aren't willing to fund the research necessary to prove you and I are scientists at heart, uh, you know, that's why we became doctors. And, you know, for me, I, I couldn't work in an environment where research just wasn't going to be the focus because you're right. Uh, having said that, the preponderance of evidence, and it continues to mount, supports the usage of these alternative proteins. So the safety aspect is really interesting because the DCM scare, remember right now, there's been no evidence whatsoever that there's a dietary link with this heart condition. In fact, the evidence points to the opposite, that there is no dietary link. We all know this is more genetically based. In fact, there was a peer review study of, of 150 of the most recent publications around dilated cardiomyopathy that concluded there was no link between diet and DCM. So, you know, I think that there's been a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, you've done a good job of trying to cover it as, as neutrally as, as possible. And I applaud that, you know, because we want to give people the facts without frightening them unnecessarily. And I do think that it got sensationalized, at least least in the U S and the UK. And, you know, people tend to fear monger and that's kind of our news cycle. But uh, the reality is I agree. We need more research. That's why with cats, you hear me very reticent yeah. to endorse that whatsoever. Even in the book, you know, I kind of keep saying, wait, 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 <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's coming. Just wait, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with the researchers, just wait. Uh, whereas dogs, it's a much, I think it's a much clearer picture, but getting back to like lentils and things like that. I think that when I actually formulated this diet, I, said, let's avoid as many of those problems as possible. Now, obviously, you know, this was right before the DCM thing, but, you know, I'm working with some of the top researchers in the world and we all knew what to avoid and, and what sort of the, the matrix should look like as far as the nutrients. And so I felt very comfortable with that aspect of it. I don't, I'm not as fearful of it as anymore. I'm just trying to find a solution. And the great news is I think we're kind of Alex at V 1.0. And I think that this is the first version. And I think that next year, as some of these cell-based uh, proteins come online, we'll be at version two. And then after that, it'll be version three. And I honestly foresee within 10 years, Alex, most people will go to a restaurant and they will have an option to eat, you know, a dead animal or something that was uh, created, you know, without killing an animal. Yeah. And I think it'll get to the stage where it's significantly cheaper to do it, to do that oh, as yeah. well, which is probably what will really drive that behavior change. I wonder, just one thing that we haven't mentioned, and I know that are available in some parts of the world is insect-based diets. 
Mm-hmm. Are they a valid option for, yeah, for, for reducing impact on the environment? Yeah. And I devoted an entire chapter. And at the time, there were none really that were out. Like this was all speculative, but I was in touch with all the researchers of the insect makes protein. I said, well, you know, this is going to be an issue. And so I will say this, they are not for me because animal welfare issues, I believe are considerable around these insects. Uh, And look, that's just because of I'm vegan. I believe, you know, that, that all life, you know, deserves to be free of suffering. So for me, you know, there's that aspect, the animal welfare, I think there's an issue. Having said that from a nutritional standpoint, it's perfectly fine, you know, and, and we're starting to see, you know, big companies like Purina in the United States has, and Canada, they've launched an insect line of dog food. So uh, I think you're going to see more and more companies migrate towards this. Remember that about 2 billion people every day eat insects. So most of them, of course, are in Asia. And usually it's considered more of a snack food. Like, you know, we might have, uh, I don't know if you have chips down there or whatever, you know, yeah, fish and yeah. chips or whatever, like a snacky type street foods. And that's how it's primarily served. We have a long history of eating insects. So it's really, again, no surprise to me. When you look at the protein makeup of insects. I mean, you know, again, in the animal kingdom, the same nine amino acids are preserved, you know, which is why I like fungal proteins, because again, they're one order above uh, plants. So they're more closely related to an animal than a plant. But regardless, you know, when you look at those nine amino acids, they tend to be in the same mix. Why? Because they're in animals. And so insects make a, a really smart choice. And I think they are part of the solution. They're not part of my solution because I have issues around animal welfare. But you know, I do think from a nutritional standpoint, they seem to make a lot of sense. And they're available now as well. So even if we're thinking about it and we go, well, let's make the change today and that's what happens to be on your shelf then you know so that's something to think about that's a really good point because you know at towards the end of the book and you know, when i talk about the future of foods and all this stuff and because you know i felt like wow a lot of this book is becoming aspirational and sometimes you know people when it's like well it's not here now you know he keeps saying wait um, but there are solutions and it, that's why i mentioned insects and went heavy into the science of insect based proteins and in pet foods because i knew this was going to be available quickly and you're right accessibility is the key to solving climate change right we have to have real solutions Like electric cars were a dream a decade ago. I have a Tesla. So these are those things that slowly, you know, creep up on us and then it's everywhere. And I think that what I want to do was just be that early sentinel to say, hey, there's another thing to think about here. Don't overlook the impact that pet food is having on climate change. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to make sure that we're solving all of the problem in totality, not just, you know, in silo. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess to finish off kind of this chat, Ernie, I'd love to kind of touch on your first love, if you like, because the other way that we can reduce the impact with pet food is actually not feeding quite so much. Feeding them less. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. yeah and obesity, you know, it, it's all intertwined because I think when I was young, I was in vet school in college. We grew up in the South. So Southern United States is known for deep fried everything, you know, so fried chicken, fried everything. Right. I mean, we fry okra. Right. I mean, vegetables, you know, my father, like his father before him and his father before him all had severe cardiovascular disease. And so I witnessed from an early age, my father, you know, having open heart surgery, nearly dying, you know, scaring me. Right. I mean, as a child, you really don't think of your parents being mortal. And yet here was this reality. And so I think I became very interested in, in longevity at that point. And that's actually whenever I switched over, I stopped eating meat. I stopped eating fried foods because you know, I was like, well, it didn't work for my great granddad, my granddad and my dad. So I'm going to try something different. And it was really shocking to me, Alex, to go through this personal health journey and being literally sort of cast off by much of my family. Uh, my family has farming roots right now. I mean, we still are in cattle, you know, in, in Georgia. And so, you know, you know, this is what I grew up with. And suddenly I'm going, hey, I don't think this is working out so well for everybody. I'm not going to eat it anymore. And yet they were like, oh, you must be, you're an extreme, you know, what's wrong with you? And so I think that that longevity and obesity all sort of started interconnecting for me. And I started seeing my patients, you know, again, having more and more obesity, having, you know, more and more health and obesity related disorders. I was seeing more diabetics, more crippled arthritics, more dogs with, you know, kidney failure. All of these are directly related to obesity. 
And so that's really what sort of led me down that path. It was that longevity and quality of life. And, you know, uh, I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of, you know, amazing researchers around the world on this, because really what I was doing in the early 2000s was just raising the alarm. I think like I did with this book, you know, I just back then, you know, nobody was talking about obesity as a health disorder or disease in dogs and cats. And I was kind of the first to go, hey, wait a second, I think there's a problem here. And this is one of the things, Alex, I love about being a generalist because, you know, and I use the term a specialized generalist because I, I think, you know, you have to be able to focus intently on certain areas throughout your career. But a generalist perspective gave me this wide swath or perspective on, wow, there's a lot going on here with dogs and cats and this guy's limping and this cat's diabetic and there's kidney failure over here. And I think specialists, again, when they start to look at a very narrow bandwidth of the cases, they don't connect the dots. So I'm a fan for generalists. If you are a general veterinarian or a vet tech out there, this is, I think we have a lot of power. But again, a long-winded way to say obesity is part of the solution for climate change because we know that most people are overfeeding their, their dog or cat 25 to 40 percent. That's 25 to 40 percent extra meat, extra animals that are being farmed, you know, extra farmland that's being diverted to feed those animals to feed the pets. You know, so there's a huge impact downstream of it. And I think that one of the other solutions is obesity, although I will share with uh, your listeners real quick, um, if I may, Alex. My father's passed on now. And obviously, unfortunately, you know, one of the last bits of advice he gave me, I had uh, run for political office here as a, as a Democrat. And so that's a more liberal progressive party. And I'm in a very conservative part of the country. So my father had watched me sort of, you know, do all this obesity stuff, you know, then he watched me, you know, try to run for office uh, Senate here in, in this great state of North Carolina. And he was very sick at the time. And he pulled me aside and said, you know, Ernie, I just wish once in your life, you could pick something that you could actually win, <laughs> that you could actually accomplish. He goes, he goes, because you've got this obesity thing. That's no, you're never going to beat that one. You got this environmental stuff. That's going to take decades to, and then politics, you know? So Alex, I will say this. Uh, I think that no matter how, daunting the odds may be. And, and really, it doesn't matter if it's a big issue or a very small issue. No matter how daunting and overwhelming and intimidating it may seem, you know, we all have an obligation to try to make the world a little better. And that's really, you know, what people like you are doing. That's what, you know, I try to do in my own little small way. But we really, you know, I think whoever's listening to this today, if you can just on the daily, just say, there's one little thing I'm going to do better. You know, there's one little thing I'm going to do to try to make some positive impact somewhere beyond myself. Uh, I think, you know, again, that just changes the whole world. And what I really hope, you know, Alex, is that the younger generation, especially the younger Gen Zs, you know, they really do seem to take a much broader worldview than any of the preceding generations, including my own Gen X. And I really am hopeful. I, I'm can, every day, you know, I just... I retain my enthusiasm and optimism for the future. And I just, I hope again that your listeners can share with me in that, that hope and joy. Absolutely. Well, this is one um, battle that we're all in together and hopefully we will win because the consequences of failure are pretty catastrophic. So with all that in mind, where can people go to learn more about this? If their interest is peaked and they really want to dive into this, um, you know, obviously there's your book as well. I'd love you to tell everybody a little bit about that and maybe any other resources that, you know, are really helpful to the pet parents out there. Yeah, you can find me anywhere on social media or on the web, Dr. Ernie Ward. That's D R E R N I E W A R D, Dr. Ernie Ward. You can find me at .com, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook at drerniward.com. There is a book website called The Clean Pet Food Revolution, uh, but you can find that also on drerniward.com. You can buy the book in Australia or you can have it shipped to Australia, I guess, uh, from Amazon. That would be the easiest way to do it. It's really an easy read. You know, it, it's kind of this book that's kind of, I know one of the early reviews described it as this eco thriller <laughs> disguised as a pet food book. But, you know, we really do kind of paint a very broad picture of what's actually happening. What I think people, the readers that have liked it the most, the fact that we got to interview all of the major players in the meat alternative space. So, I mean, we got to talk to all the people that are now in the multi-billion dollar companies back before they were in the multi-billion dollar companies. So it's a really fascinating read to, to sort of tell you what's happening and what's about to happen. So the clean pet food revolution, uh, how better pet food will save the world. That's the name of the book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Really at the end of the day, 
what I want people to do, Alex, is to make a, you know, talk to their vet, make an appointment, talk about their diet, you know, talk about the pet's weight. If your vet is not talking to you about your pet's body condition, you need to ask. And if they don't want to answer, find another vet. You know, Alex, the, the stakes are just too high. Of all the things that you can do to extend the longevity and prevent disease, it is what you feed your dog. And that includes overfeeding it. So, you know, I, I just encourage everybody to have that conversation. And, you know, Alex, I have no tolerance or patience anymore at my age with a vet who doesn't want to talk about pet food. It's just like, that is so foundational to medicine that, you know, if you're going to ignore that, then what else are you ignoring? And you're just not a vet that I want to, I want to recommend. So yeah, that would be my biggest call to action for people today. And if you want to follow me on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever, definitely uh, I'd appreciate that as well. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Eddie Ward, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting you today uh, to you today for this, you know, incredibly important topic. One that I think is becoming more and more in everybody's consciousness and deservedly so. So thanks very much for the work that you do. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure and my pleasure. And, and again, Alex, I'm a huge fan. I mean, you just continue to put out fantastic content like this. Uh, you really are telling stories that people need to hear all around the world. And I'm just a huge fan and honored to be on your show. I okay, very kind. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. <laughs> So my thanks again to Dr. Ernie Ward for joining us for that fantastic conversation. And for those of you who really want to dive deeper into this topic, I really would encourage you to pick up his book, The Clean Pet Food Revolution, How Better Pet Food Will Change the World, because it dives into a lot of these topics in a lot more detail. It runs through the actual science and the evidence behind a lot of the recommendations that are being made. And it really is a a, a truly interesting, fascinating and very readable book to run through. And I'll make sure I'll leave links to that in the show notes over on the website. You can access those at callthevet.org along with all of the previous episodes. And for those of you who haven't listened to the previous episode at the start of the year or towards the start of the year with Dr. Maddie Hewitson, where we spoke more about sustainable pet parenting as a whole, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that as well, because there are other changes apart from food or as well as changing or thinking about your pet's feeding habits that really can all add up to make a substantial difference. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this. So head over to social media. I'm on whichever platform you're going to be on. Probably Instagram is the one that I favour the most and spend more time. So send me a DM over on Instagram where you can find me at Our Pets Health. Leave a comment on one of my posts um, and I'd be really interested to hear your views on today's topic. And so all that's left is to thank you again for the reviews. Thank you for sharing it with your friends and family. And until the next episode... I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet show because they're family. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.